Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the next instalment of the collection of true, historical, cryptid encounters. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help both the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled Pond Creek Road, Part 2. Let's get straight into that. May 2019, one of these sections was opened and areas that were not that accessible were now very accessible. On the 10th of May, Jerry Turner, a 29-year-old, six-year US Marine veteran, was driving eastbound and about to cross one of the new bridges constructed over a tributary of the Neosho River. He was returning from a job he had held at a local Native American casino at about 3.15 a.m. Now, there was absolutely no traffic on the roads tonight since he'd left work and it had been raining lightly all evening. Jerry was also upset with his boss who had changed his schedule at the last minute and so now he had to be back at work at 10 a.m. later that morning. As he was about to cross the bridge, a large shape ran across the road, moving right to left. It seemed to step three or four strides and clear the road, but at his speed he still almost hit it. As he swerved to avoid the shape, his car went into a skid and the tail end of his car swung around and slid down the embankment with the front of the car pointing up the embankment. Totally shaken by the sudden change of direction and situation, Jerry had trouble trying to locate his cell phone and flashlight and then pushed open his door. Jerry struggled to walk up the embankment, slipping several times on the wet grass and mud from the new construction of the slope leading up to the roadway. Still stunned and disorientated from the experience, he didn't stop to think about why he was in the situation to begin with and the shape that put him in it. As Jerry walked onto the roadway and took a minute to gain his senses before he called for help, he heard a strange whistling coming from the opposite side of the road from the tree line. He stood listening to the sound for a second and then realized that he was all alone on a dark lonely road and with absolutely no street lights and not a house in sight. The only lights there was was his cell phone screen and his small but fairly bright flashlight. The whistling continued and then he heard nothing. He looked up for the number for the tow truck he had used before and was relieved when a guy answered and was already in the area and will be on scene in about 20 minutes. And so Jerry hung up the phone and stood there and waited. About three minutes after he had hung up the phone, the whistling started again. Only this time, oh, it was closer. He snapped his flashlight up and pointed it at the area of the sound. At first, he could see only trees, but then he saw what looked like eyes, like when an animal is in your headlights. Eye shine, they call it. And the eyes were at a height that a normal animal would not be at, and the eyes were larger than that of a raccoon or a possum that would normally be in the trees. And it was blinking at him. Slowly, it began weaving around from behind a tree that was further back in the tree line. Jerry narrowed the beam of his flashlight so it would project further and with a greater intensity without moving to a brighter setting on the flashlight because he knew the batteries were older and didn't want to run them down faster than need be. And the light must have hurt the animal's eyes because it must have closed its eyes or looked away. He could no longer see the eye shine, and at the same time he did not know where the animal was now, but it seemed to irritate the animal. He started hearing a huffing sound and it sounded like a large animal with the undertone of a growl while it was huffing. This completely unnerved Jerry. He was a deer hunter and had been in the woods all of his life, and now he did not know what he was hearing 
or even seeing. The sounds continued for several more minutes and seemed to be moving, but he could not get a fix on the location of this animal. And then the air seemed to change, like he would smell during an electrical spark. That strange ozone smell, and then the hair on his arms began to stand up, and this overpowering sense of dread came over him. His stomach churned, and then he saw it. The eye shine. It was close, almost at the edge of the wood line, and it was blinking and swaying back and forth. As a marine, he's been in some scary situations in his time, but the fear that gripped him now was new and with a force he had never known. He stood only 130 feet away from this thing, and he could still not make out the outline of the shape because of the bushes that it was standing in. And now it was grunting at him, and it was getting louder and more aggressive sounding. Just as he was thinking of charging up on the thing, he saw the amber flashing lights of the tow truck come on over the small rise in the road, and he switched from the continuous beam of light to the strobe function of the flashlight, so the tow truck could see his position. And when Dale Watkins, the tow truck driver, seeing the light strobing, he turned on his 55-inch spot and floodlight bar on top of his truck, and a 35-inch spot on floodlight bar mounted on the brush bumper of the truck, and daylight seemed to erupt all around the area. And that's when he saw the shape standing by the bridge-side barrier wall. Uh, it was tall, probably in the 9 or 10-foot range. Brown or black hair, it seemed to be shaggy all over, except the face. The face seemed to be almost bluish, grey. Its chest was large and shoulders were broad. Its nostrils flared and it bared its teeth. As it jumped down into the water below, because Jerry heard a splash just as the tow truck then pulled up. Dale jumped out of the truck and asked if he was okay. You see, Dale was a US Marine veteran too. And Jerry responded that he was okay. But we need to get out of here quick. Dale looked puzzled and saw the look on Jerry's face. Dale pulled his pistol from his waistline and handed it to Jerry and asked him to watch his back while he hooked up his car. And Jerry looked all too relieved to have a weapon in his hand. He had to pawn his pistol last month in order to make rent. Even he didn't think that that pistol would help with what he had just seen. But it was nice to have. Now Dale had Jerry's car hooked up and back on the roadway in 20 minutes. Jerry's right rear tire was blown, and Dow said, We're going to tow it to Roger's convenience store, change the tire there. And Jerry replied, Damn right, we're not fucking changing the tire here. As they drove the seven miles to Roger's, Dale asked for his pistol back, and Jerry put it back in Dale's hand, and Dale responded with, You saw it too, didn't you? And Jerry looked at Dale with shock and surprise, and Jerry costed Dale for about a half a mile, and Dale said, Brother, I drive all the time, at hours of the night, and when I move through this section of the road, I always slow down. You see, they cross through here all the time, especially since they have finished this new part of the road. People who walk this section of the road, they are clear of it, before dark. That's why when you told me where you were, I hightailed it over here. Why didn't you tell me? Jerry stated with anger. Now, would you have believed me? Dale simply said. Jerry now watches his speed in the wood line. When he drives through here after dark and, oh, by the way, he got a pistol out of the pawn shop and it will never leave his sight again. You see, because you never know what you'll come upon when you drive Pond Creek Road. And this encounter was relayed to this offer by Dale, the tow truck driver. This following encounter was given to this offer by a good friend. That is a member of the Bigfoot Research Organization in Missouri. In the fall of 1985, a hunter in the area of Monkey Island, of Grand Lake of the Cherokees on the western bank of the island, and was privy to a terrifying horror-filled encounter at dusk. Now, while this is not directly on Pond Creek Road, it is in the vicinity, and it is worth noting. 
The island was much more rural and wooded in this time period, and hunting was allowed at this time. Today, it is not allowed, and there is considerably more development on the whole island. Jason Walker was out bow hunting in the western edge of the island in mid-October of that year. He had placed his tree stand about three weeks earlier, and was preparing to make a deer camp out in the area two weeks prior to the season opening. He was clearing the camp area slowly. He would move brush and relocate it and then move his firewood in several stick logs at a time, not wanting to create a big disturbance of his presence in the area, just making slow adjustments. He had several small tree hanging corn and acorn feeders in the area of his tree stand and was making adjustments to the brush and small trees in order to help his firing lanes during the season's hunt. And Jason, he loved hunting of all kinds, but archery season was his favourite. When this time of year came around, he was all about it. The season was about five days away. It was about 9am when he was returning to his camp area to make some other adjustments when he arrived at the campsite. He was shocked by the state of the camp's location. Someone or something made a complete mess of the site. It or they ripped down almost every improvement he had made. Now this infuriated him. He had no way of proving who or what did it. Because of the state of the ground and the ground cover. It was hard to determine who the culprit was because the only tracks, if you could call them that, were large indentations in the ground. And some of them resembled canine tracks. Or rather large canine. And others were just large ground disturbances. They were about 17 to 19 inches long, but all of them lacked any real detail. Now, he was so upset. He wasn't thinking about anything other than a human was messing with him. And Jason set about trying to reassemble the camp with what was salvageable. As early afternoon waned into mid-afternoon, and Jason almost had his camp back into some sort of order and he had laid down on a small log platform that he had constructed and covered with a blanket, when suddenly he quickly sat up. It was almost as if he was experiencing the effects of a high fever, with dizziness and disorientation overwhelming him, and then the nausea set in. Jason couldn't figure out what was the problem and the issue he was having, and why it set on so quickly. For about an hour and a half, he laid on a makeshift bed and was curled into the fetal position, feeling like he was on the verge of vomiting. Coupled with this, he kept sitting up and looking around, as if someone or something was watching him, or was very near to him. After some time, the nausea went away, but the feeling of being watched remained with him. Jason stood up and braced himself against the tree. He decided that he would climb up in a second tree stand that he had placed in a large 44 inch diameter oak tree just above his camp. Now he used it for observation and it was placed some 41 feet up in the tree. He utilized a pole climbing rig, much like the ones that the electric company guys used to ascend electric poles. This allowed him to climb up to the stand and not have to deal with ladders and the mid-afternoon was giving way to the early evening, and the air was cool and fresh. He was always amazed at how the air was different, just a few dozen feet above the ground. And so he settled into his spacious two-man stand with ten inches of overhang, that meant he could remain in the stand and be completely comfortable. He perched it just above his camp. You see, Jason was five foot five, and he could almost lay down on a still great floor of the stand, and still not be seen. And Thirty minutes after settling into the stand and the forest sounds went silent. A feeling of despair, foreboding and fear came over him. His bow was down on the ground, but his 45 caliber pistol was in his vest and he was wearing the vest. He had two extra magazines with ten rounds apiece and he still could not shake these feelings. At one point he was actually shaken in fear. Jason kept telling himself, Come on, man, get a grip. And then an odor crept up the tree. 
Uh, it smelled like mangy dog that had been rolling around in its own exron. And then he heard what sounded like footsteps coming from the direction that would place it behind his camp. Hey, Jason thought, oh, maybe the assholes that tore up his camp had returned. The feeling of fear and despair left him, and anger was moving back in on, thinking that he was going to catch someone red-handed. And what Jason saw would change his life forever. Stepping out of the wood line was a beast of what he thought only existed in movies and myth. It walked on two legs, and its legs resembled that of a dog's legs, but massive and muscled. It was covered in bristly hair, and its chest was broad, and shoulders were rounded down, not like a man's, more like an animal, like those of a dog. And the arms were abnormally long with hands, like those of a raccoon, but with one to two inch claws, and the head was like that of a large wolf, and with very pointed ears, and on the crest of its head, it was covered with thick, bristly hair that stood up quite like a mohawk. And the teeth were sharp, and there was a lot of them. Immediately, Jason's anger turned back into fear, and then he was transfixed with absolute terror. The beast moved around his camp, sniffing and smelling, and Jason said to himself, Oh my god, it's tracking me. As the sky turned to a radiant red-orange, and then finally to a cool dark blue and purple, as the full sunset was moving across the sky, nightfall was an unwelcome sight, and Jason knew that a terror-filled night was ahead of him, and he was unsure of what the next hours would bring. Hopefully, continued life and happiness, but it seemed to him that the universe was signaling his approaching demise. Now the beast continued to circle below him, it rifled through the camp, sniffing and knocking things over. And it was sniffing and rummaging through his makeshift bed and ripped his blanket to shreds of cloth. But he could tell that it was getting very agitated by its failure to find him. He wanted to grab his pistol, but he was so afraid that he would make noise and it would know for sure where he was, that he could not bring himself to do it. The beast circled the camp again and was snarling and growling, as its anger and frustration was climaxing. And then it stopped, turned its head, and snarled at the spot where he had climbed up the tree and into the middle of the two spiked trails that he had left as he ascended up the tree and at the spot where his crotch would have touched and rubbed onto the tree bark. The beast began to intensely smell the scent line that he had left as he travelled up the tree, and then the beast looked straight up at him. Jason knew that it could not see him, but it was fully aware that he was in the tree stand, and that is when he saw the eyes, the intensely yellow eyes that seemed to penetrate not only his soul, but his knowledge that he wasn't the hunter, he was the prey. The beast stood up and reached as far as it could up the tree. At about 17 or 18 feet, it sunk its claws into the tree bark and ripped a trail of three-foot claw marks down the tree. This action made the entire tree vibrate. He could hear the beast sucking in there and the growling howl and snarling gnashing of teeth. Unleashed Jason's absolute terror, fear and loathing. Immediately, he urinated and defecated on himself. And Jason lay there on the floor of the tree stand, curled up in a ball, shaking and choking back tears. And while not taking his eyes off the beast, his heart leapt out of his chest when he saw the creature bury its claws of its left hand and plant the claws of its right foot into the tree, and then it raised itself off the ground and planted the opposite claws as it began to climb the tree. And then Jason heard a roar that turned to a siren howl that morphed into a shrill scream. The beast let go of the tree as it was climbing up towards him, landing onto the ground and going into what could only be described as a defensive posture. 
as the thundering like noise of a train and a bulldozer moving through the trees and everything else began to get closer and closer to his position. The beast looked up at Jason and it seemed to move its mouth and as what he could only describe it was saying something to him in the order of I'll get you yet. And just as the beast mouthed those words a thunderous crash as a wake of trees, shrubs and undergrowth exploded into the small clearing. And there, in the midst of the growing chaos, stood a large, what only Jason could describe as a giant covered in long hair. It stood better than ten feet tall, and was massive in every aspect. And then a second one slightly smaller burst into the clearing from a separate location. As the two roared and pounded at the ground with their fists, the two creatures charged a canine, and the fight was one of epic proportions and levels of violence that could not be imagined. The three monsters were locked in a melee that took them out of the small clearing that they were clearing brush towards the east. Now was his chance. Jason grabbed the safety rope and dropped it down from the tree stand. He slung himself over the railing and mountaineered down the tree. When he hit the ground, he could feel the vibrations of the fight through the ground. He quickly located his bow and went to look for his backpack, because his truck keys, well, they were in it. The fight between the monsters seemed to be intensifying, and it also seemed that it was moving back into his direction. Jason could still not find his backpack, and was frantically looking through the gear, debris and other equipment, when he heard a noise directly behind him. And there, standing by the large tree, he had his second deer stand in. It was a creature that was covered in hair about the size of an eight-year-old boy, but it looked like an overgrown chimpanzee, but a lot bigger and stronger. I stood there with a look of fascination and curiosity. Out of the peripheral vision of his right eye, he spotted his backpack. Jason moved swiftly and quietly towards the backpack, as the small creature never moved towards him. It just seemed to want to look and see what he was doing. Once he had his backpack in hand, Jason turned his back on the small creature and walked quickly away. It never followed him or made a single sound, as the fight of the three monsters broke into the clearing again, and Jason slipped into the wooded brush line, and they began to run for his life towards his truck. It was over three quarters of a mile away. As he was running, he could still hear the massive fight raging behind him, but the sounds of the battle were getting more and more distant. And when he reached his truck, he was amazed that he'd found his truck in the depths of the night. He pulled his keys, and while the fight of the monsters was still dominating the soundscape of the night, it was more distant, and he threw everything he had on him into the truck bed, unlocked the door and started the truck. Jason drove as fast as he could without wrecking and with several turns he was off of Monkey Island and with several more miles and turns he was back on Pond Creek Road. He pulled over at a rest stop that was outdated by today's standards and was well a little intimidating and scary at night. He stopped the truck in a dry through parking space, left the engine running and opened the door and got out and put his hands on the driver's side fender of the truck and then took a deep breath and put his head on the truck as he tried to collect himself. Now Jason sold and gave away his hunting gear and his hunting rifles and shotguns. He kept the 45 caliber pistol and he never reported his experience to anyone. But, 20 years later, after a diagnosis of stage 4 colon cancer, he related his experience to a gentleman who was a member of the Bigfoot Research Organization that is currently operating in the state of Missouri. Jason Walker passed away from cancer in June of 2006. He never hunted again after the incident of 1985. Pond Creek Road has a way of winding 
and weaving its way through the countryside and the lives of any and all that travel it. And in late July of 2018, Donna Waywright is a 27-year-old single mum who was a student at the local college in the area of Northeastern Oklahoma. As she was driving home one night on a very long commute from attending class, the compressed summer school sessions were busy and fast-moving. It seemed like it was homework assignments one day and tests the next. It was about 3.18 in the early morning when she felt the urgent need to relieve herself after a day of eating every unhealthy thing in the cafeteria on campus and now she was paying for it by having a stop at night at a rest area on Pond Creek Road. The same rest area that Jason Walker stopped at in 1985 after his unfortunate experience. The rest stop is tucked back off the actual main road and is set back more than 1,100 feet back off the road and the main roadway it is a curved field approach to the main area. The road up into the main area is lined with light poles. Almost most of them don't work or have had the lights busted out. The landscape of the area is unmaintained and ragged. The trees are large and overhanging on the roadways. The undergrowth is bushy and erratic in its placement. The trees and bushes cast long dark shadows with existing lights that work, and the trash cans are either missing or full or non-functioning. Most of the concrete tables are broken in some manner. In the evening, the area takes on a surreal sense of an uneasy atmosphere. The restrooms seem to be the only thing that gets any real attention. As to the maintenance, these 1960s designs allow for the use of steel framing and heavy gauge corrugated metal sheeting bent into a spiral form that put the center of the facility in the middle of the widening spiral that allows the user to walk in and move through the spiral until the user reaches the center. The facility wasn't entirely closed in by the metal sheeting because there was not an exhaust fan. The design called for a 12 inch opening of the sheeting at the bottom of the structure. That was created by the very crude method of installing the sheeting 12 inches short of the concrete surface of the floor and external walkway. This allowed for natural venting as there was a vent at the apex of the structure, primitive and archaic by today's standards, but very utilitarian of the day. In the 1990s, after a series of sexual attacks, rest stops built in this style. The Oklahoma Highway Department installed heavy steel doors on the restrooms in order to give the user more privacy and security. Many of the users complained that the doors were so heavy that they could hardly close them. And Donna was approaching a rest stop and she was dreading having to do this, but it was getting critical. She had stopped here before, but that was in the daytime and it spooked her then. She was trying not to think about it as she drove to the entrance to the rest area. Her headlights illuminated the twisting road and the overhanging trees and the untrimmed bushes that were swiping at her car, and a few light bulbs that were still working cast the shadows that only appeared in her nightmares and horror movies that her boyfriend always took to her on their Friday night dates. The headlights of the car fell onto the two restroom structures located at the back of the area. They backed up against a large area of dense woods. As she pulled up, turned off the car and her headlights, she grabbed the roll of toilet paper out from under her seat because the last time there was not any in the restroom. As she opened the door, she realized that the only light in the area was a light pole located in between the two structures. And one of the two lights on the pole was burned out and she could see that both structures inside lights were working. But she grabbed her flashlight, and off she went. She closed and locked the car door, and started walking the 140-some feet up to the structure, marked women's. And Donna was about halfway to the restroom when she heard something moving in the tree line, behind the men's restroom, and it sounded large. And she could hear limbs breaking and the swishing of brush, as if something was moving through it. She entered the restroom and the lights were functioning. Everything seemed to be in order. Then she returned to the door and pushed the heavy steel door closed and slid the slide lock closed as the full three inches into the latch on the door jamb. There, nice and tight, 
This gave her extreme comfort. At least she had felt safe. Donna moved to the toilet and placed toilet paper on the seat and unbuttoned her pants and then sat down on the seat. She was nearing the end of the reason that she was here in the rest stop and she could feel something tugging on her pants that were down around her ankles. She looked down and she could see nothing that could have been tugging on her pants and her feet and pants were some six feet away from the back wall of the restroom even though the 12 inch opening went around behind her she could see how nothing could have been pulling on her pants. Well, she just chalked it up to being late and tired. And Donna settled back into completing her task when she felt the tugging again on her pants. Now, she popped her head down quickly and was terrified at what she saw. It was a hairy hand, an arm, that was reaching under the wall and through the opening, and it was grabbing at her pants and the tugging was the hands with one inch claws at the end of his fingers, just belly snagging the cloth of her jeans. Donna screamed and jumped from the toilet seat and fallen into the dirty floor while she was getting to her feet and pulling up her pants. Donna's eyes caught what was the most horrifying sight she had ever seen. The partial head of the beast and its arm and shoulder were wedged underneath the still wall and the floor of the restroom sweeping its arm around wildly as it was outstretched towards her. The face of the beast was contorted and was ugly. It had a small snout. It looked like it had a deformed chimpanzee or baboon or a mix of the two, and the face was likely covered in hair. Its teeth were sharp and jagged. The beast's eyes were dark, almost black or dark brown. And from the way it was crouched down, she could see a long tail that would thrash around like an agitated cat's tail would. And the growl and howling yells or screams, well, they were terrifying. She stepped back against the far wall when a thud against the wall and a hand grasped her ankle. She tried to step away from the noise and grip of the very strong creature. And she screamed as she fell and the grip of the beast tightened and began to pull her under the gap between the wall and the floor. She put her right foot against the lower part of the wall and pushed with all of her strength and she was able to see the hand, wrist and lower arm and with a 14 inch mag light that her boyfriend bought her and she complained endlessly about it being too large and too heavy. <laughs> she began to hit the wrist and lower arm of the creature and after four very hard hits it let go of her ankle but not after it left deep scratches with its claws. Now Donna was able to kick away from the wall just as another arm was reaching through. And she got back to the center of the restroom and the banging on the door began. And she could see the feet of the beast standing at the door. The feet were not much bigger than 12 inches. They were not human-like and they seemed to have a toe on the side of the foot. The top of the feet were covered with long hair there seemed to be more of them banging on the sides of the walls of the restroom. The sound was thunderous and deafening. Imagine being an oil drum and it being hit with multiple hands. She knelt in the center of the restroom where it was safe from the search of the creatures and she covered her ears and screamed for them to stop. Then there was a loud sound on a roof of the restroom which was covered by the same steel sheeting and in the center of the ceiling was an 18 inch vent hole that had a vent cover that had just been ripped off. A long arm of one of the beasts reached down from above and was within 20 inches of being able to grab her hair on her head. The terror that ran through her was unimaginable. The lights flickered, went out and came back on several times. And during one of these blackouts, she saw the arm of the one at the door began reaching under and upwards towards the sliding latch upon the door. She started panicking and was screaming, Oh God, oh God, don't let them in. Oh please God, don't let them. Oh God, please. The beast's hand could only reach within three inches of the latch handle. This caused her to react out of panic and as she rose up to run to the door, the hand that was reaching through the wide open vent hole in the ceiling grabbed her right shoulder with its claws and sunk them in. 
and she began hitting the hand with a flashlight. I let go of her and left puncture marks on her left shoulder, and soon blood started running down to her chest. In the process of getting it to release her shoulder, she dropped the flashlight and it rolled towards one of the outstretched grasping arms on the floor. And while the beast was trying to grab the flashlight, it inadvertently knocked it back to her. As it was spinning and the beam of light strobed around the restroom, causing her to become disorientated, she grasped the light and ran to the door and began beating on the hand, an arm of the beast reaching under the door. In the grip of the struggle, she was slashed on the side of her right upper thigh by the claws of one of the creatures reaching up and under the wall. A few more hard strikes with the flashlight and the beast quickly pulled its hand back from underneath the door. She then could see the ceiling denting in from the weight of the three to four creatures that were on the roof of the restroom. And the creatures were communicating with some sort of gibberish and they seemed to be coming up with a plan. She started moving back to the center of the room when she'd seen the headlights of an approaching vehicle. They were bright, like a light bar on the truck, and with a few wah, wah, wah noises, the creatures were quickly withdrawn from the restroom, and she could hear them running into the tree line and the underbrush directly behind the restroom structures. Donna wasted no time and ran quickly to the door and looked through a crack between the door and the heavy metal jam of the door frame. The truck was just pulling into the parking space that was about two spaces over from her car. She pushed the latch over and pulled the door open and it smacked against the wall as she ran through the door with a flashlight in hand, screaming, Help me! Help me! Watch out there behind there! And she pointed to the restroom structures as a man and woman exited the truck she was trying to communicate with them and the woman noticed the blood on her clothes and the woman and the man ushered her into the truck and the truck squealed its tires as it backed out and left down the drive that would put them back onto Pond Creek Road. Now the man and the woman took Donna to a medical centre where she was treated for her injuries and shock. The sheriff and two deputies interviewed her in the hospital but all they would hear is that it was an animal attack, probably a black bear protecting her cops that she had stashed in the area. The authorities wrote it off as an animal issue and several deputies went out and searched, but nothing was found. As for Donna, she was admitted for observation in a mental hospital for a period of two months. And after a battery of tests and medication, she was released into the custody of her two sisters where she made a slow but steady recovery over a period of nine months. The only oddity was the discovery of a strange bacteria in her bloodstream. It was a bacteria only found in large primates. Now, humans can contract it only by close contact, and she was treated for it, and the only antibiotic was noted in a medical chart, but a pathology report was not located in the medical records when her older sister obtained the records. Now Donna was killed in a head-on collision in July of 2020, almost two years to the day. Donna, who related her story several times by recorded statement, of which this author was allowed to listen to, in one sitting and was allowed to take notes. And a man and a woman who helped Donna that night, well, they were never identified in the deputy's report. Donna's sister has a copy of the report and Nowhere are the names of the statements that they gave to the sheriff's office contained in the report. This author went to the county sheriffs to obtain a copy of the report and the file could not be located. And this author is not surprised. The department was not very interested in being helpful, but this author is stubborn and will continue to ask questions. The author was made aware of the encounter and attack by a close friend of mutual acquaintance with Donna's older sister. Pond Creek Road is a unique and terrifying pathway that is sometimes a very mundane and peaceful route to travel. But no one knows when its vicious and brutal side will make itself known. The surfer has gone to great lengths to protect the identities and keep the locations of these encounters 
anonymous, like the participants as witnesses requested. Let this conveyance of information help you in your journeys and travels, with the knowledge that there are things in this world that exist and exist only in order to bring our nightmares into reality. Note from the author. The encounters portrayed here are factual. Certain aspects were dramatized to convey the intensity of the encounter and should not be misconstrued as to lessen the actual authentic encounter information. As to lessen the actual authentic encounter information. Until next time, be safe. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest pounding, spine tingling, collection of historic cryptid encounters or accounts there. A humongous thank you to my good friend, Mr. Edward Ed Smith, for putting this together. What a wonderful treat, right up there with some of the most intense encounters or reports I think I've ever heard. Would love to see more of this style from yourself, Ed. You have a fantastic way of words and an even greater grasp of structuring these reports into an enjoyable but still chilling format. Well, guys and girls, another one bites the dust. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer, want to get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is dmtforestofear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you've all had a fabulous weekend at home with friends or family, or maybe on the road with a long haul. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you guys are enjoying it. And you're looking forward to a lovely, warm and fun-filled summer. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.